for this morning's scripture text. I invite you to turn your attention to Colossians chapter 2, verse 4. Colossians chapter 2, verse 4. And I raise this scripture to your hearing. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. And for a title of today's message, I'd like for you to think about dangerous situations in the church. Dangerous situations in the church. Let us bow our heads, please. Heavenly Father, mighty gods, we take a few moments, Lord, to share from your word, Lord. Father God, may we draw in, lean in, Lord, and Father God, through the power of your Holy Spirit, would you speak to our hearts, Lord. Use your messenger as you see fit, Lord, that you are glorified and your people edified. Would you block out all the distractions, Lord, that come our way, Lord, in this sacred time as we preach from your sacred word. Be with us now, O Lord, in the mighty, wonderful, beautiful, magnificent, and awesome name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Let all the saints of God say, Amen. You know, parents give children instruction, small children in their home when they're growing up, to advise them to help them to watch out for dangerous situations. For example, uh, parents will tell their children, don't take candy from strangers, don't talk to strangers. Don't get in a car with a stranger if mom and dad aren't with you. And so, again, we just want to protect our children from dangerous situations. Matter of fact, I know that many of your parents, special parents of uh, African-American males, um, I know that I had the talk, and the talk wasn't about the birds and the bees, but as my son, when he was a teenager, started to drive by himself, and sometimes driving at night by himself, I would tell him and I would share with him the talk. Son, if you're ever pulled over by a police officer, please always be respectful, be courteous, keep both hands on the wheel, and if you feel like you're being mistreated, please do not react. Come home and let mom and dad know, and we'll take it from there. Again, the talk, because it could otherwise potentially be a dangerous situation. Amen? And, and also, as we think about uh, Black Lives Matter, we, we know that, one, we do know that all lives matter because Genesis 6 and 9, well, excuse me, Genesis 9 and 6 tells us that we're all created in the image of God, so therefore under that umbrella, all lives matter. But in particular in this season, Black Lives Matter from a sociological and psychological perspective and a real practical perspective in that Black Lives People of color have been so mistreated and abused and oppressed that, and in this season, it's been raised the consciousness of America. And so, black lives matter. Not discounting that all lives matter, but in particular, the focus right now is black lives matter because black lives have been treated so poorly without respect. So, within the black community and without, Black Lives Matter. Now, for truly the Black Lives Matter, it's got to be all-encompassing. So, therefore, black babies being aborted, they matter. Black lives in prison matter. Black lives that are shot indiscriminately on the streets of our major cities matter. And, in addition, Black lives, as we go out into the community, as we face interaction with law enforcement or others, our lives matter there as well. And we want to make everyone aware of potentially dangerous situations that we can navigate through so that everyone makes it home safely. And in today's text, Apostle Paul of sorts is cautioning the church on potentially dangerous situations in the body of Christ. Because St. Paul is writing, as we talk about, as we go through this book of Colossians, the letter to the church of the Colossians, that the purpose Paul raises up in 
Colossians 1.28 if you present everyone mature in Christ, that all of us as believers in Christ Jesus, that we would grow to maturity in Christ. So therefore, we've got to navigate through or be aware of and avoid those dangerous situations that can occur in the church. And this is Paul's heart. Paul's like a good shepherd, a, a good overseer. He's concerned about what he's seeing occurring or the potential to occur for dangerous situations in the church. So he recognizes these dangerous situa- situations in the church that would otherwise cause people to walk away from the faith, to stunt your spiritual growth, that you would miss all that God has for you. Uh, to enslave you to sin, to keep you in bondage to sin, cause you to doubt your salvation through Christ, Christ alone. Again, keeping you from growing to maturity so that you can be all that God wants you to be. Mm. As Paul would say in Philippians 3 and 2, for these false teachers that he's cautioning people about, uh, beware the dogs, amen? When you, some neighborhoods, when I walk through, they have signs up, beware the dogs. Saying they, if you come in their yard, they say, hey, we've got a dog in the yard, amen? So similarly, Paul's saying, beware the dogs, amen? Those who teach false doctrine, those who are false teachers who, uh, who distort the word of God for their own gain. Beware. So today we begin to talk about dangerous situations in the church. Dangerous situations in the church. And the key, one of the key verses we want to raise up is, again, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. Again, there are people going around who were slick talking, that they had this charisma, they were likable people. Uh, but they were tricking people, they were deluding people, they were fooling people, they were deceiving people with their false philosophy and their own self-developed internal ideas, uh, not looking to the Word of God, not seeking God or the apostles to help instruct them, but they were doing their own thing. Uh, they, these plausible deceptions. I remember when I first really grabbed that word plausible, it was when a certain administration was in place and they had done something that was somewhat illegal, but they had a plausible denial. And so even the body of Christ would be careful because there are some teachers going around that, that have some plausible arguments that will cause you to doubt Jesus Christ, to doubt your salvation and to cause you problems in the body of Christ. So we've got to be aware. Those that have these deceptive arguments, uh, which sound reasonable and plausible to the human mind, but to the spiritual mind. See, it's hard for the, it's the human mind, it's impossible for the human mind to grab hold on, hold of spiritual things, amen? So we, that's why we need to be in Christ and growing in Christ so we can grab the spiritual things that God has for us. The carnal mind has to develop plausible excuses or plausible things to, or ideas, arguments, to distort the truth of, of God's word, amen? And, and especially to the uninformed. It's like, for example, you know that you really can't believe everything that you read or see on the internet. And especially during the campaign season, you've got to make sure that you go back and research and make sure that it's truth. Because the enemy can make a lie sound good and the, and the good sound like it's really bad, amen? Amen. So we want to encourage you to be aware of these dangerous situations, even for us today, in the body of Christ, so that we can survive and thrive and be all that God wants us to be, but we've got to be aware of dangerous situations. Now, when I uh, was in the corporate world, I had some managers that reported to me, and uh, when managers would bring me problems, I would ask them, I said, okay, well, it's nice that you can identify a problem. Guess what? Most of us can identify problems, but when you identify the problem, bring me a solution. Now, we may not take your solution, but at least it shows me you're thinking like a manager, amen? And so we have help for him for those of you who are in, on your jobs, if you see a problem, also recommend a solution as well, amen? It shows, and you never know, they might just promote you, amen, to solve that 
situation, amen. So here, Paul lays out the problem. He identifies the situation. He makes the church aware of the situation and us as well. We can use it for us today as well. Again, those dangerous situations to be aware of so you can protect yourself, amen? That's why some of you have alarms on your homes that, that once you're all sleeping, you turn the alarm on so that if anybody tries to come in or break a window, there's an alarm that goes off. Some of you have smoke detectors, so there, there's a smoke gathering in your house, there's an eh, eh, eh that goes out that warns you, hey, there's a problem somewhere in your home or your apartment, amen? And so... So here, first Paul says, hey, let me identify the problem for you. So one, he identifies the problem, and the problem is dangerous and destructive teaching in the body of Christ. Let me raise up Galatians 2 and 4, which reads, I say this in order that no, no one may delude you with plausible arguments. So that's the problem. They're using human traditions, human philosophy, trying to bring it to the word, the house of God and distorting the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, not from a spiritual perspective, but from a humanistic perspective. That sounds like, oh, that sounds reasonable. And basically what they're trying to do is take God out of the Bible, take the Bible out of the church and just be a nice association, a nice group, amen, a nice club. Because see, if God is not in your philosophy, if God's not in your teaching, if God's not in your doctrine, you're just a club, amen, without the Lord, amen. So it can sound good, but it's contrary to Scripture, Amen. It's almost like people trying to say, like, well, they, they develop these constructs, they develop these teachings that kind of say, if they were God, and see, just in a humanistic philosophy, if they were God, here's how things ought to be. So basically, they try to put God in a box, amen? But you can't keep God in a box, amen? So that's what we have to be aware, because there are those out there who would lead you astray, Amen. And then in Colossians 2.8, he identifies a pro another problem. It says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Again, again he says there's a, there's a battle going on. That, that, that Here's God, God through his apostles, through Jesus Christ and the apostles. God is teaching through them. And yet... Satan always has a counter-teaching to try to marginalize Jesus Christ, to try to disrupt the believers in Christ Jesus, takes them captive, amen, with fake and false philosophies, amen? And so there's nothing new under the sun. Go all the way back to Genesis, and we see that the serpent whispers in Eve's ear, did God really say? Again, to cause doubt, amen? That's what these false teachers do. They cause doubt, and that through human tradition, according to, here's what it ought to be. Well, if it's not right, it's not right, amen? There was a time in our nation where some of the great pulpits in America espouse that nothing wrong with slavery, nothing wrong with Jim Crow stuff, but we know now, we, and we've always known that as black folk, amen, but we know now nationally that all of that was a life in the pit of hell, amen? It was wrong, but it sounded good, and those who were not in the word of God swallowed that Kool-Aid hook, line, and sinker, amen? Can we talk this morning? Amen. So, we have to be aware, because there are those who would lead you astray, even in some pulpits in America, amen? Uh, you know, for example, you, you, some of you might remember the guy named Jim Jones who was teaching out in California around and then took him to a place in Africa, and they all drank the Kool-Aid, because mm, they got caught up. They stopped following Jesus and started following this guy's teaching. Remember, some time ago, there was this group, uh, they all had the same kind of sneakers on, and one night they all did something, and they all died the same night trying to think that they would go to heaven or somewhere? Yeah, because of false teaching, amen? And, and we see it in our world even now. We see people naming and claiming, uh, you sow a seed in my ministry and God will bless you. If you don't, God's going to curse you. That, you know, that's a life in the pit of hell. Hey, can we talk, amen? You got to be on guard. Oh, if, if I come in one day and say, I've got a handkerchief full of my sweat, I'm going to sell for $1,000 and God will heal you, you know that that's a life in the pit of hell. So come on now. And so, so we've got to be on guard and not falling for every whim and doctrine that tries to seep into the body of Christ. So we got to be on guard. And then in verse uh, chapter 2, verse 18, we see these things. Let no one disqualify you, saying that you're not worthy, so you're not right, 
insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. So Paul is trying to, he's warning the church that there are those out there that are saying, Christ is not the way. They're saying they're trying to insist on asceticism, which means a system of self-denial to gain merit with God. That that I'm going to deny myself or I'm going to beat myself to show I'm righteous with God. But see, that's no power in that because it's not godly, amen? And, And a lot of people can develop their own way that they think is right but it's wrong. It's contrary to the word of God, amen, because God's not in it. So people try to get you on their own system. Hey, I got a way to get you to heaven. Do it my way. No, follow Jesus Christ, amen. People that false worship, you know, they, some people worship plants or the moon or animals. Yeah, no, that's wrong, amen. Think about people who used to carry rabbit's foot, thinking their foot was lucky, the rabbit's foot was lucky. Well, what happened to the rabbit? Wasn't lucky for the rabbit. Yeah. So some people have visions and they say, well, uh, in a vision, God told me this. And again, it has nothing to do with the word of God. It's contrary to the word of God. But they say, I- I've got a vision. And they want to make you feel like they got a secret. They got a way. And only if you follow them will you be able to make it to heaven. Mm. Or have a great life. Yeah, see, that, that's, that's on a particular experience that they're having that they think they got it all. And then they want to bottle it and package it. And contrary to the word of God, do their own thing and get folk to follow. Even try to get people in the body of Christ to follow them. Mm. And it comes from a sensuous mind that is just corrupt. That's what Paul said. Paul said, here's some dangerous situations going on that's trying to corrupt the body of Christ. Be aware. Oh, it might be some smooth talking, good looking folk doing it. But it's just as dangerous to your spiritual health. And your eternal life is at stake. Mm. For example, maybe I could say, uh, hey, you know, I've got this water, a little jug of water. I sell it to you for $1,000, and God will heal you. God will bless you. God will answer all your prayers. Yeah, see, that's, if we aren't grounded in the Word of God, we'll fall for those kind of things. See, and unfortunately, there's some preachers going around who are perpetrating perpetrating a fraud and pimping God's people out for their own gain. And Paul's saying it's a dangerous situation. We got to be aware. Because see, Christ wants you to be all that you can be. But there are some folks out there who just want to take advantage of you and teach you what they think is right and not anything to do with the word of God. My friends, we've got to be in the word. So one, as, as you identify, as Paul identifies a problem, as you identify a problem, guess what? you got to identify a solution. And Paul identifies a solution. He gives a solution. And i and just raise up a couple things. One, in Colossians 2, verse 5, he says, For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. So Paul's not what he's writing to them. And he's trying to encourage them, hey, you've been firm in your faith. You've been steadfast in your faith. As a matter of fact, word firmness has to deal with uh, background reading the Greek, like a soldier standing at attention, being firm, in a t- being in attention, and not being moved. So he's encouraging them, hey, you, you're firm in your faith. But the problem that Paul sees, the, the caution that Paul wants to bring to them, hey, Don't rest on what you've done in the past. Don't think you've got it made because the enemy will constantly be attacking you, attacking you, and attacking you like erosion on the beach coming after you and after after you. So therefore, you've got to be steadfast and firm in your faith. I remember sometimes walking by uh, contractors that are building, pouring the concrete for a sidewalk and when they pour it, they'll smooth over it and have it level. And what they say, they put signs off, but don't walk on it because it's still moist. It's still wet. The concrete is not, it's not cured. It's not firm for you to walk on it. Matter of fact, we know that when it's 
moist, we can put our handprints in it. Not saying I ever did that. We'll put your footprints in it. And even after it's dry, we'll still see the footprints. Mm. And so it's not ready until it's cured or firm concrete. Then you can walk on and do everything you want to. And so Paul's encouraging the church, be firm in your faith. And that's why it's so important for us to be firm in our faith, to be stable in our faith, to be on a solid foundation in Christ. Well, how does that happen? My friends, the enemy will constantly attack you and attack you and attack you with doubt, with plausible arguments, with what if kind of things. But my friends, here it is, lean in now. That's why you and myself and everyone else in the body of Christ, we've got to be in the word of God. We've got to be solid in the word of God. Amen? Amen. We've got to be in the word of God. We've got to be studying the word of God. We need to hide God's word in our heart so we won't sin against God. We've got to be like the Bereans. Paul talks about the Bereans. He says the Bereans were more faithful in that they searched the scripture to see even what Apostle Paul told them was true. Mm, And that would have been largely the Old Testament, amen? So, So you and I, when we hear things across the pulpits in America, across radio stations or things we download, Take it back to the Word of God and see if you can find it in the Word of God or get some understanding how they got to their conclusions. And if you can't, leave it alone. It's spoiled product. Leave it alone. It's trying to corrupt you and move you away from standing on a solid foundation. Mm. And that's why parents of small children, that's why you need to make sure that you're teaching your children the scriptures at home. Matter of fact, we're going to be starting a a home Bible study group uh, since we're going to be in this COVID shutdown for a Bible study, for for our Sunday schools, so that you have an opportunity to do Sunday school, but also to do some devotional teaching at home as well. We'll have more information that come out in the near future. So, matter of fact, look at Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 7. It says, you shall teach them diligently to your children. Talking about the scriptures. Talking about the word of God. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. My friends, say, parents, it's, it's your opportunity, it's your job, it's your responsibility to teach your children the ways of the Lord. Because if you're not teaching your children, Satan will destroy them one way or another. Through temptations, through crime, through false philosophy, and lead them astray. And they'll be vulnerable because they won't be aware of dangerous situations because you didn't teach them. So parents, you got to be on the ball, amen? Amen. Because if you don't teach them, the world with all its ungodly philosophy, and when I say the world, I mean that system that's in place that's headed by Satan and leaves God out, the world will get in them. And then when they're 25, 30 years old, you wonder what happened. So get the word in there, get the word in their consciousness, get the word in their spirit, and they'll know that when trouble comes, they know to go to God. And that way they'll be able to discern truth from error because mom and daddy taught them. Matter of fact, mom and dads, You also need to model before your children what you say you believe, amen? Because, see, children will catch more of what they see than what you teach them, amen? So, mom, dad, you need to be praying together, praying for your children, talking about God in a home, and make sure that God's not expletive on on a sentence. Yeah, and and with this, as God has shut down the world almost, what a great time to hit the reset button at home. Forget about what you haven't done in the past, but moving forward, pouring into your children, amen, like you never have before, amen? Yeah, in your home, in your life, in your family. Yeah, because the enemy out there would love to pull them down. So be firm in your faith. 
Be firm in your faith. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, because there's no excuse. We can grow in the Word of God. Amen. So be firm in your faith. See, because the enemy wants to keep you away from the truth. The enemy wants to distort the truth, keep you away from the truth, keep you biblically ignorant. And that's something that's just human nature. Matter of fact, you know that President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation to be effective January 1, 1863, and in that executive order, freeing all the enslaved persons in the South. However, in Texas, not until June 19, 1865, was the Emancipation Proclamation enforced. Some two and a half years later, the Major General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston, Texas to enforce the Emancipation Proclamation. Again, the enemy, the slaveholders, didn't want the, those who were enslaved to know that they were set free. And see, similarly, Satan does not want you to know all that God has for you, all the promises of God, here and later, amen, that God says, I'll never leave you, forsake you, that God is always with us, amen. Yes, and God has freed us from the bondage and the penalty of sin and the power of sin. We've been freed from sin, but the enemy wants to keep us enslaved to sin. Yes, and to know that Jesus Christ died for our sins, amen? He paid the price for our freedom, amen? Yes, he did, for our freedom from sin, amen? And that's why those who are in Christ, we can stand before God because we're he sees us with the righteousness of Christ, amen? Amen, that's what Calvary is, is, is all about, that Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead, and all who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ have eternal life, amen? You've been sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption because you're marked out supernaturally that you belong to God, amen? And when you take your last breath on this side of glory as a child of God, one who has trusted Jesus Christ to be Lord and Savior, your, your soul is immediately ushered into the presence of God. Amen? Yes. But the enemy does not want you to know that. The enemy wants you to think that Jesus is not the only way, or Jesus is, is insufficient. Yeah. And if someone's teaching you that, you need to run from them. Amen? Amen. Yes, you do. Amen. So Paul says in Colossians 2, 19, and not holding fast. And here's what the, those who have been corrupted, here's what those false teachers were teaching. They were not holding fast to the head, and we know the head is Jesus Christ, from whom the whole body is nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. And from that we see that, see, Christ Jesus is the head of the church, amen? And we all are connected together through the head, Jesus Christ. Don't get it twisted. You're not the head. I'm not the head. Jesus Christ is the head of his body, the church. Amen. He paid for the church. He bled and died for the church. Amen. The ecclesia, those who have been called out of darkness is the marvelous light. You're in the church. You're the church. Amen. And not just on Sunday morning, but you're in the, you're the church wherever you go 24-7. Amen? Amen. But we've got to stay connected to the head. Amen? So we've got to keep holding on to Jesus. Amen? Keep holding on to Jesus. Amen? Don't let go. Keep holding on to Jesus. Amen? Because, see, the enemy wants to corrupt you and have you not to hold on to the head, to go your own way. Amen? But, that, but see, we stay connected to God through the scriptures by studying the word of God. We pray, we worship, we read, we study, and we go out and serve God, amen? Because we humble ourselves under Almighty God. We submit to the word of God, amen? And see, it's like when we're connected to the head, I, I love marching bands, amen? And I, I love those marching bands that have the... the, the 
drum major, amen, and the drum major will lay, let's roll their head back, and they'll be stepping and striding, amen, and you know the drum major, and all the band members got their eyes on the drum major, and they're following the drum major, amen. I stopped by to tell somebody that Jesus Christ is the drum major for the church, amen, not you, not me, but Jesus Christ, keep your eye on the drum major, Jesus Christ, amen, and stay in step with the drum major, amen. He bled and died for the church. Stay in tune with the drum major, amen. Praise God, amen. And see, Jesus Christ ought to be your savior on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Every day, not just on Sunday morning, amen. Because if Jesus is only your savior on Sunday morning, you're lost, amen. He's a 24-7 kind of God, amen. Yes, every day, amen. Praise God. Jesus Christ, he's our drum major, amen? Yes, stay in touch. So keep holding on. Keep holding on to Almighty God, amen? Hold on to Jesus. I I used to work in a theme park, and I used to ride the roller coasters, amen? And I remember test driving a roller coaster before it was opened up to the public, and I remember riding, and I would hold on to the rail, no matter what twists and turns we had to go through, I was holding on, amen, and my knuckles turned red and maybe even white, but I was holding on, amen, because it would go up and down and turn around, but no matter what goes on, my friends, I want to tell you, hold on to Jesus, amen, so when, no matter what life brings your way, I'm holding on to Jesus, amen, I'm yet holding on. It might look tough. I might be going up a rough side of a mountain, but I'm holding on to Jesus. I might go down through the valley, but I'm holding on to Jesus. Don't let go of Jesus. Amen. Hold on. Hold on. We even sing a song here in Antioch. Hold on to the uh, brother Curtis Taylor sings. Uh, don't, don't take your hands off the gospel pile. Hold on. Hold on, old soldier. Don't let go, my friends. Yeah. God is mm, so good to us. Amen. Yes, he is. But there are those who are trying to get you to go your own way and do your own thing. No, stay in tune. Stay in step. Keep holding on to Jesus. Yes. And I want to encourage you that in your walk with the Lord, mm, as we stay in his word, my friends, because the more we know his word, the more we know him. The more we know his word, the more we will know the truth. We're not worshiping the written word, we worship the living word, amen, that the written word exposes to us, amen. And I don't care what people say. Because see, I hope your faith is somewhat like my faith. I remember what my grandmother would say, that her faith, even in tough situations in life, she was immovable, unshakable, her solid faith in Jesus Christ, amen. And she would say things something like, not what I heard, not so much what I read, but see, you don't know like I know. Oh, hear me now. You don't know like I know what Jesus has done for me. Mm. And then you got to tell somebody your story, amen? When you didn't think you are going to make a way, God made a way out of no way. When you didn't know how you are going to feed your family, God made a way out of no way, amen? When the doors were shut, you couldn't get in, and God burst open those doors that no man could shut, amen? You don't know, like I know, what Jesus has done for me, amen? So I'm not going to back up now. I've come too far, and he's brought me too far to back up now. I'm standing on the solid rock of Jesus Christ, the rock that don't roll, amen? Amen. All other ground is sinking sand. It might sound good for the moment, but in the long term, you're going to drown. Amen. Uh, hallelujah. My soul cries out. Hallelujah. I'm standing, standing on the rock of Jesus Christ because he's brought us all a mighty, a mighty long way. And Jesus is worthy of all praise, all honor. And glory that we give him, amen? Because he redeemed us from the pit. He loves us so much that he died on Calvary's cross. He sanctifies us, amen? He keeps us holy, amen, before Almighty God. He saved us. He saved us from the pit of hell. And our souls cry out to him. Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, and our Redeemer. 
I remember sometimes when I was small, my dad and I would go in a crowd and he'd say, son, son, stay close to me. It's because he knew there would be some dangerous situations. People might try to do me harm and things like that, but he says, son, stay close to me. And I would reach out and hold daddy's hand and I wasn't afraid when I was holding daddy's hand, amen, amen. And I just want to leave this with you. I want to encourage you, stay close to God. Stay close to the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. He's got your hand and he hasn't brought you this far to leave you. Be encouraged, my friend. Be aware of those dangerous situations and you stand against them, amen. By standing on the word of God. God loves you. God loves you real good. Amen.